It is the Blue Room. It is your instant match reaction for Everton 2, Rotherham 1 after extra time in the third round of the FA Cup. My word, Everton made hard work of that. Uh, joining me uh, now, Mark Mosey and Dave Downey. Uh, Mike Diash is going to join the call at some point as well. Uh, we're live on YouTube. Let us know what you thought about it. Um, good performances, not many. Bad performances a lot. Uh, just give us a few shouts on that. Uh, just, just before we get into it, I just wanted to, to quickly mention something. Obviously, on social media at the moment, there's a lot of talk about Cheng Tosin and his celebration and, uh, after the second goal and what that might refer to. Uh, just something that we have noticed it. Obviously, we've seen the discussion around it, um, but I think it's important we wait to see what he has to say about it first and get further clarification because there's different angles, there's different viewpoints on this. Um, and yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, if it turns out that, that something has happened like that, then we'll chat about it then and, and obviously condemn it. Uh, but we need more clarification on this first and foremost before we discuss anything. And this is the instant match reaction. And unfortunately, we can't get into stuff like that straight away. Uh, but we will get into the football match. Uh, Mark, thank God that's over, mate. It felt like it was going on forever and ever and ever with those injuries and extra time. Yeah, I think on the back of what you said about Tosin, this is probably the point where we say it's a shame that that, that detracted from such a good performance. And but, um, what we saw on the pitch was absolutely dreadful. Um, it was it was just one of those games that, I, I don't know, a, a few people cited it pre and during the game is that these early kickoffs when it's cold at Goodison... And the game never really seems to get going and the opposition very quickly realise that, that they can work themselves into the game before Everton really get a chance to, to get off the mark. And it was probably shocking in that sense that Everton did manage to start so well. And I think when Tosin does get that goal, you, you just expect a sort of intelligent and professional performance just to, just to kind of dispatch the whole game, really. Um, even... <sighs> ridiculously now looking back what 15 or 20 minutes into the game you're already thinking about how do we make this as comfortable as possible so that the team is as fresh as possible for Tuesday um, looking back now that was clearly ludicrous but in a game that seemed to go on for about four and a half weeks it was nice eventually just to just to get ourselves over the mark because there was some some really worrying times where you thought that this this kind of procession of an FA Cup third round to to what we hope will be a really promising FA Cup run under Ancelotti. It, it looked as though it was going to be an enormous banana skin, but um, I don't know. In, in, in the coming days, we'll probably look back and think, well, it's nice just to be in the hat and, and hopefully all just pretend that this game never happened. <laughs> Dave, what, what did you make of it all, mate? Yeah, very attritional, wasn't it? Um, I, th I made the comments on social media. It seems those sort of cold winters, afternoons, where it's, the sun's absolutely blazing. Nobody wants to be watching football at Goodison Park, nor playing the game either. I can't remember a decent game we've had in in sort of a midwinter, you know, early kickoff, and and that just it was so reminiscent. People were saying to me, it's reminiscent of that Leicester game, that dreadful Leicester game on New Year's Day a couple of years ago, where nobody wanted to play, nobody wanted to be involved, nobody wanted to watch it. Um, and I get that it's like that. I think for. We're sort of very privileged as a Premier League side. I mean, that, that was a huge day for Rotherham, as it is for most, well, for all lower league teams. You have to go to a, a team that's either, well, basically just in a higher division, not necessarily a Premier League side either. So, I mean, you have to appreciate that, that that's a huge occasion for them. I thought they played the socks off as well. I thought they were really good in patches. And, you know, if you if you were an absolute alien to this, you'd wonder who the Premier League side was for large portions of this game. And, there was nobody in the Everton ranks, I think, that really did themselves any justice in terms of pushing for a first-team place because there were a lot of fringe players on show, a lot of players who we've been indecisive about for some time. They've showed it in flashes this season, but more often than not, they've they've let us down. Um, and it, it that's what's so frustrating, I think, when you get a game like this. You know, if you're, I don't know, Bernard when he finally gets on or if you're Anthony Gordon... You're sitting there before the game thinking, do you know what? I've got a real chance to impress you, not only because I've finally got a chance to perform in the team, but also I'm playing against a lesser opposition. We should be putting these to the sword. We should have this game over with within half an hour and, and be able to, to express ourselves and, and really push to get me placed in the team when it comes to the Premier League games. And 
never really works out like that for, for Everton players. I know we've seen it in the Carabao Cup this season with the likes of Nkunku, who eventually got on. Um, I wonder if he'd gone missing at some point because we haven't seen him for a while as well. Um, but it, it seldom works that way in this competition. And, and all due respect to, to Rotherham, I think they, they were really good, put us under pressure. I think that the spell when uh, the equalise, uh, sorry, before the equaliser, they deserve to get back into the game. There's no doubt about that. Periods in the first half where they had us under pressure for prolonged spells. Um, but from an Everton point of view, yes, ultimately it's about getting in the hat, and we'll raise our game. We'll raise our game on uh, on Tuesday against Wolves. We'll raise our game against Villa if that goes ahead next week. Um, so yeah, I mean, what it all boils down to is making sure you're in the fourth round. We did that just about um, with a few scares along the way. But in terms of performances, I take absolutely nothing from that game. Mike Diasha joins us now as well. Uh, what, what did you make of, of all that, mate? Um, you know, I understand what Dave's saying about being in the hat's the most important thing, but there were spells during that game where I was still up screaming at my TV and it's not really something I expected to be doing after he went ahead so early on and seemed to be playing some really good footy. You know what? It's it's not been an ideal day today. I'll be honest with you. Um, I went out before and almost slipped over on a load of ice. Then I stood in a puddle and it went all into my shoe. That wasn't good. Oh. Um, I know. Milk was off when I had my breakfast this morning. It wasn't great. Um, and then I had a shave with my electric razor and it ran out before I got to my neck. So I'm sporting a neck. Oh. <laughs> I just noticed that, mate. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a bit deep. It's a bit deeper than five o'clock shadow, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I wonder so, why you're holding the phone in that one, in that particular yeah. angle. <laughs> yeah, it's um it's been an interesting day today, let's say that. And what was really nice about it was to see a classic FA Cup underdog story where the team with their backs against the wall and far less talent than the opposition just manages to squeak through. Oh, it's lovely when that happens, isn't it? Well well done, Evan. It was just terrible. It's just it, it it reminded me a lot of last year in the third round. It seemed like a group of lads who have absolute disdain for this competition. I think that sums up most footballers now, which makes me a bit sad. Um because I think the only people who really want to progress in this competition are the fans right now. Players don't want the extra games, especially not this season. If if ever there was going to be a year where they had to up their game it will have been this one because of the absolute embarrassment and debacle that was last season. That's all your team talk had to be, was don't do that again. That's it. And it wasn't. We didn't see any sort of reaction from that. There was no slight from the same players who let Everton down then that this is going to be a, this is going to be a new thing. We're going to go and attack this competition. They just they have no appetite for it whatsoever. And it's really disappointing. And it was the attitude of a team that got spanked 3-0 at Wolves last season. That's what I saw in that team. And it was no, well, it's no coincidence that the entire midfield was the same as the one that was last season. Yeah, I think I think for me it was, it sort of, it became an issue with the way they were playing, which then in turn became an issue with the attitude. It was sort of like, you know, we got the opening goal, and I think in the first twenty minutes it was, I was quite impressed with the way they played because it was sort of like, this is a a team that's been flung together. And so often in these cup games, you see it takes a long time for us to get going, even when we're playing against teams, you know, two or three leagues down the, the pyramid. But they settled in really quickly. Gordon was looking bright, you know, Tosin got in a couple of times and obviously ended up scoring. You're thinking, this is this is good. It's looking like a, a professional job. And then all of a sudden, like a couple of passes went awry. They stepped up 10, 20 yards and put pressure on our back four and everything just completely fell apart. And I think that's that, that's a worry for, for me, Moe, I think it's something we saw against, you know, the, the game that stands out for me earlier in the season where Everton just crumbled under a little bit of pressure was Southampton. You know, a, a team that are in your face, they're aggressive, they get up and, you know, they're happy to, to leave that space in behind if you want to knock it there. But they will hunt the ball and try and win it off you really high up the pitch. And Everton just disintegrated that day as well. And I think it is a, a flaw with this side that, you know, press resistance is very much a, a modern day football phase, isn't it? In the way in which you know teams can get out and, and spring forward when that pressure does come. But but Everton stay against a, a little bit of it from from Rotherham just just seems to falter. Yeah, that's when you need a bit of confidence and resilience in what you're trying to do in terms of. I mean, in particular, playing out from the back um, because we, we've seen time and time again teams kind of attract that level of pressure from from opposition, but. You unfortunately, if you buy into that system and, and that's the way that you're going to play, you, you have to expect that. Um, teams 
regardless of, of what calibre in the football league they are, are not going to show you the level of respect that some of the Everton players look like they needed today in order to, to put a nice calm foot on the ball and take four or five touches before picking your next pass. It just doesn't happen like that, especially as Dave referenced earlier, where some of these footballers are playing the, the biggest game of, of their entire career. Um, and, and Everton need, I think in a game like today where, OK, you won nil up, but... You, you are under pressure and you are relatively poor in terms of your performance. You need a senior player. Oh, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to leave the senior thing out because they're the, the footballers who tend to let us down most. But you need a calm head on the shoulders to, yes, put a foot on the ball, but also not to... I think I think the problem with the, the whole, in inverted commas, putting your foot on the ball means that you kind of take a step back and you let, you let the next 10 minutes just pass you by and you don't impose yourself on the game in the way that the manager's probably told you to before. What what you want in terms of someone taking the game by the scruff of the neck is, is not to nullify your own team to that extent, but actually go out and do the things that you'd plan to do. Go out and find your wide men, make your incisive runs. And when Everton are under pressure and we look as though we need to get ourselves back into the game, we do go into that sort of neutral phase where we just kind of all huddle together and hope that nothing bad happens for 10 or 15 minutes. And as much as we don't necessarily expect Rotherham to be the ones to to turn the screw, we, we've seen it time and time again in the Premier League where Everton try and do this. And we try and just kind of hold off for a little bit and hope that the bad things pass. Um, and unfortunately, you get punished when you when you go into those sorts of modes. Um, as much as we... we I think you could point most of the fingers in terms of complacency today about where our where our problems were coming from. Even at the stage where you go to one all in whatever minute it was relatively early on in the second half, you expect the last half an hour, especially when you're bringing people like Bernard on and when you're bringing people like Gilfie Sigurdsson on. I was delighted to see Gilfie Sigurdsson come on today, not purely because of how poor the other central midfielders have been, but... He's exactly the type of player in those games where you just think quality will surpass everything here. If he gets on the ball within 30 or 40 yards of goal, he's got the intelligence and the ability to pick out players in key areas to be the difference. We saw it on Boxing Day at Sheffield United. And I think that the inability of these players to really press home their advantage, primarily technically today, is the one thing that that really irked me. I, I wasn't looking at that game at any real point as much as we, yes, we were complacent. I, I honestly didn't watch it and think there's a real attitude problem here, uh, and and that's potentially a little bit more worrying. I thought we're just we're just technically not ri- not very good. Uh, we we looked on a very similar par from a footballing point of view. Um, I think if I was going to put a silver line on them, on this at all, there were certain points in the game where I was watching thinking this won't be tolerated in the next few days. This won't be tolerated at Molyneux. We we've got through this game, but there's an there's a sense of urgent reaction required going into that game, and, and that's probably the only straw that I could clutch at the moment. Yeah, I think David, you know, the the play out and the, the lack of quality is, I think that that does come down a lot to to your midfield as well. And I think you know Tom Davis had a, a bit of a, a tough game today, all in all. But I think the player that the most people were disappointed with, and you know, despite the fact that he, he stayed on the pitch for a long spell, which was Andre Gomez and. You know, we got got a little glimpse of him against West Ham. He came on and, and played well, but it feels like at the moment when it when it comes to, to Andre, that's all you get really. It's it's twenty minutes here and there, but he does some nice things. It, it just looks increasingly like that the footballer we had in that first spell is is just no longer in there. Yeah, I think that conclusion's being reached. I think game by game now, rather sadly. Um, I felt that the one saving grace he had recently was the cameo he made against Sheffield United. He come on, yeah. and it was for what twenty odd minutes, um, and and he looked he looked like he was back to a certain extent. But then that might well be why is that it was only twenty minutes. Uh, I don't think he's capable of dictating Premier League games for long spells. Um, don't think he's able to keep hold of the ball for too long if he if he comes under pressure from. Um, not even people who are bigger than him, really, just people who are more mobile than him, which is, you know, let's let's face it, without trying to be harsh, pretty much everyone you come up against in the Premier League has got more mobile midfielders than than, than he is. Um, it, it's it's quite a 
a hard thing to get your head around, really, because it feels like there's a sense of injustice there, doesn't it, given the injury? But I think we're entering a dangerous territory now. If you're still in that way of thinking that this is because of the injury, because, you know, how, how long do we give it before you start saying that's no excuse anymore? I, I actually think that time's been and gone um, for quite some time, to be honest with you. And I think we're in a situation now where we're looking at a player that is going through the motions without anybody really saying it. it you know, it, it feels like uh, it feels like Michael Jordan in Space Jam when all of his mates, when he becomes a baseball player, say that he can actually play baseball. <laughs> uh, everyone just seems like they're being really, really nice to him. I can imagine it behind the scenes, like, oh, that's a great ball, or that's really unlucky if he puts one out of play. It feels like we're in that stage because you want him, to, you're so desperate for him to do well. Uh, you're so desperate for him to show anything that was like that first well, it wasn't a season, if we're honest, was it? I remember on that Boxing Day game where we beat Burnley 5-1 and he actually had a poor game that game and, and people were saying he looks like he's burnt out. Uh, Marco Silva was using him far too much, didn't give him a minute's break, things like that. You, I remember you saying it, Matt, he looked like he was running to the ground at that time. Uh, and, and I think slowly we're starting to realise that that is the norm for this lad now. Um you, you don't you don't see it coming back because it doesn't look like anything that's immediately fixable or even fixable in the long term. Can he become quicker? Can he become stronger? Well, yes, in theory, but it th- these are things that take a long, long time to fix. And he, he's reached a time now where he's had a long, long time to get over that injury, if indeed that's what he would say internally is the problem. Um, I, I just actually think it, it's not it's not going to happen. It's not going to return for him and. You look at Everton invested a lot of money in him. Uh, you just sort of wonder what happens next. And I think at the earliest possible opportunity, um, which may be when Alan returns at the end of the month, he's not going to be involved and, and he'll be a bit part player, if anything. And I'm pretty sure that's how Ancelotti would want that right now and look to maybe replace him in the future. Quite quite sad. Um, but then, you know, we, we can't afford passengers, can we? we? We've proven that today with the championship side running us close. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to single out players negatively when everyone was shocking today. But it, it, it was just there were just times in that in that game where they were putting us under a bit of pressure when we were keeping the ball. That you sort of go to reaction in your head is, well, you give it to your, your playmaker in midfield. Well, certain, you're... certain players there, Matt. I mean, it, it, we we can use that as a measuring stick. If somebody put it to me on Twitter that well, it just must be a motivation thing because we know, you know, you wouldn't swap any of our players for theirs and all that sort of thing. But but some of them, I mean, the motivational factor is an issue in itself. If they're not motivated to play for us in a cup competition, then, you know, they shouldn't be on the pitch for a start. But if, it, if it's not that and it, it's down to genuine lack of quality and um, players not being good enough to play for the football club anymore, I, I, I think there were some alarm bells, not just for Gomez, but for several players on the pitch today. Hmm. Uh, Mike's back now. Um, better angle, hiding than your chin, mate. He's got a microphone and everything now as well. <laughs> what, what did Searching you for a polo neck, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Digging in the wardrobe for a turtle neck. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what, I don't know how much of that conversation you were, mate, but what, what did you make of the midfield today and how seemingly flimsy it was at times? I think the fight's just gone out of Andre Gomez. I don't think there's any fight left in him. And, don't blame him, to be honest. You come back from an injury like that, it takes up so much mental and physical energy. You're going to burn yourself out eventually. And as Dave said, I don't think you can sit there for the entirety of Andre Gomez's career and go, well, he's still getting back up to speed from the injury. He's still, still getting back. Yeah, well, you know, he'll, he'll get there. still getting back. Because by the time that happens, suddenly the other side 30, and then it'll be... All right, well, you know, on the downside of his career, you know, he did have that horrible injury and that sort. Of, that that feels like the conversation that is going to be had forever about him now, which is a shame. But I feel like today was a bit of a watershed for him, a really, really negative one. I think he now is quite comfortably Everton's worst midfielder and is quite comfortably Everton's last option when it comes to midfielders. The, there is no one I wouldn't have out ahead of him at the moment because. As Dave said, it's not about ability. It's about fight. And that there are moments in that midfield where everything in his brain, in his legs was slower and it just needed that bit more fight to go with it, to try and just drag himself through that. And there was nothing. It was just sort of felt like he didn't really want the ball very much. And when he did have it, he'd take almost as long as he could with it. And 
there were times when there was a pass on, but instead of trying to make the pass, he just booted it into the defender who was stood in front of him. It, and, and that, to him, subconsciously, must have just been, yeah, fine, just get the ball away from me, it's fine. If it doesn't come off, it looks like I've tried. Just, I, I don't think there is a place for him in Everton midfield anymore. Um, when he gets to a position in, say, the end of January next summer, Everton have got to be looking to recoup, well, half the money. Could they get that for him now? I don't know. They've got to be looking to recoup something because he's not a Premier League option going forward. I think he's proved that today. But the rest of the midfield, look at Tom Davis. didn't think Tom Davis was awful, but any midfielder now he's going to struggle with Andre Gomez next to them and that being your tandem to midfield because they have to do the job of everyone else. Idrissa Garnagay learned that the really hard way for about 18 months and no one else has been able to sort of recapture that. And even then, as Andre Gomez's performance has got worse, he's done even less. So I feel a little bit sorry for him. But again, Davis a bit careless with the ball still, both of them were, to be honest. And it wasn't until you saw Abdoulaye Decore come on the pitch that there was any sense of quality or care with the ball and as soon as you get that, you get Yerry Mina in the centre of defence, sorts of going, OK, well, we'll get rid of any sort of problems and then we'll bring on a midfielder who actually wants to play and wants the ball and wants to go and hunt it down. Just made a massive difference because there was a player there with drive, effort and Premier League quality. I, I, I think that's an excellent point and an important one about what you say, Mike, with um, Gomez, the person next to him, sort of having to do work for him. I mean, we've been here before, haven't we? Uh, and and it, it's never it's never worked out when we have to put somebody in to accommodate for to do their own position and his as well. That's you know that that's a really dangerous road to go down in, in the Premier League when you're coming up against decent midfield players and mobile midfield players because we're not blessed with that anyway. I think I think to Corey is the only one. Alan Alan to an extent, I think, but in a much more controlled way. We have midfielders who who can get about the pitch, but when you've got and Davis isn't one of those. So when it's a, a combination of them, it's a bit of a lethal cocktail, really, isn't it? Because you, you've got Davis, and let's face it, he's still trying to make his way himself. He's still trying to find a level of consistency and a level of decent form in this side. And he, he's starting to do that. Don't get me wrong. I think he's been okay. Um, and looks like he's moving in a positive direction in the last few weeks. But to then put Gomez alongside him and, and Tom it always having in his head, even if it's not explained to him by the manager, because I don't imagine it would be, but he's obviously seeing situations where he's thinking he's going to lose the ball there. And there was one particular moment in this game. I don't know if you guys uh, spotted it, but it was I think it was about 10 minutes into the second half. He was sort of running towards the dugout, Gomez, with the ball. And one of their midfielders yeah. sort of comes from the side um, and basically out outpaces him to get in front of him. And then basically just sort of turns his shoulder into Gomez. It's a, it's a type of tackle I think midfielders love to make because they've got the momentum on the side to sort of brush the midfielder off, and he, he just goes lands on his on his face like it. You know, he, he's he's a you know a Tesco bag in the wind. He, he just hits the deck, um, and this guy just turns with the ball and runs away from him. That you, you said the word flimsy, Matt. I think that's a really really good word to describe him when it comes to his physical attributes, which are non-existent in games. And yeah, I mean. We're in a situation where we've probably had to play him. The core days played every game, every minute. Alan obviously was still waiting to come back. Davis and Gomez are probably the most feeble of our two midfield players, two midfield options. And sadly today, we, we bore the grunt to that, didn't we? And ultimately, it could have cost us because I thought they overran us in midfield at times. And they, had, they got into some fantastic positions midway inside our half. And they had a little bit more quality. Um, they, they could have opened us up and they yeah. very nearly did a few times and also from set pieces as well so the alarm bells are there I think because a lot of that team's going to have to play against Wolves as well and I know they've got their issues without Jimenez to bother us but I think they called Catrone back haven't they um, oh, exactly. from, from loan I think I seen that in the news the other day so obviously uh, they're looking at different options to try and bother us um, with some more mobility up front is the last thing we need to come up against. So, you know, it's alarm bells are ringing for me ahead of this game coming up. And, hmm. you know, you can you can excuse an FA Cup tie where you've just about scraped through because you get another chance to do it again, don't you, in the next round? But it's not going to cut it in the Premier League. So I'm a little bit worried, to be honest. Yeah, the cat's just getting off there behind you, Dave. Uh, could you have enough Evans and chat for one day? <laughs> Go on, Mo, sorry. Dave's cat showing more mobility than Andre Gomez. There, <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't think we've learned anything new from from those two in terms of the flaws, and that is that they can't play in the midfield too. Uh, you, you can't you can't play two in midfield and and put James Rodriguez ahead of them with two wingers and expect them to do all your leg work. Um, you, you could you could very easily, in my mind, see us going to Wolves playing a very flat three in the middle, and one of those having actually a quite good game because the the demand in terms of controlling the game and being that mobile presence in the midfield wouldn't be there. Um, the summary of that is that you you can't hand manufacture football games to suit your weaker midfielders in the squad. They have to get on board with the club's attitude in terms of in terms of their playing style and, and how this setup is going to work. As opposed to the exact opposite, we're not here to accommodate people like Andre Gomez. They have to make themselves work for Evan. Yeah, I think that, that that's fair enough in that regard. Um, just some some. Small positives. Well, I think you might put on Twitter there that you know time has come to sort of invest in, in youth now and, and and give some of these younger players a chance as opposed to the ones that continue to to, to let Everton down. Um, you know, Gordon was good for ten minutes a day before having a pretty poor game after that, but he showed flashes of sort in there. Certainly showed he could maybe do something off the bench in Premier League games. And and Kunku, I thought, you know. Mm-hmm. Our mate Chris Smith jokingly put he was man of the match on Twitter after he put one good cross in, but by the end of extra time, he probably was Everton's best player, wasn't he? Yeah, I, I'd say so. I think um, the one thing I see from players like that is effort. I see willingness to win, and it's so important in those sorts of games. You look at the final two minutes there, and Rotherham have got a break, and then Kunku's busting his way back to make an interception and track back properly. Like the effort is there, whereas you see other players that maybe, well, a lot more experienced than him who just have absolutely no appetite to track back on the final minutes of the extra time of an FA Cup game. Whereas Alad wants to play football, he wants to play as much as he can. And having those sorts of players and developing them as those next men up, that's, that's what Everton can do now. You don't need to constantly go back and be like, Right, okay, Chank Tosin, come on down. Your time's now to show us exactly what we know we've got in you, which is not very much at all. You you need to know what you have in those players. And people can say, well, you know, if they go and buy X, Y, and Z, then they'll be in with a chance of securing a Champions League place. Evan don't have the capacity to go out and spend a lot of money in this window. Have people just suddenly forgotten how close Everton are within terms of FFP problems? Like it, it hasn't just gone away because Everton are suddenly playing all right. Those problems still exist. There's still going to be issues going forwards. And you've got to make a choice now. And I'm sure Ancelotti will have sat there today and felt pretty much the same as he did this time last year with the senior players that have let him down and been, frankly, quite embarrassing there. Because that could have been incredibly embarrassing, almost more so than last year. But luckily because of the effort and drive of those he was able to bring on, that managed to change. It's a warning sign. You can't constantly go back to those players who have let you down time and time and time again. Not just you, the manager before him, the manager before him, the manager before him. These players have just let down managers with their effort so often. He's got rid of some of them, hasn't got rid of all of them. But you know what? Instead of just going back to them and still just carrying on and committing to play them, Let's see what we have in the young lads who will actually give you 110% effort and might actually get better because most of them do. Most of them don't just stay inexperienced if they have more and more minutes. And you know if they're bad footballers, yeah, fine, we find out the bad footballers. But that, to me, seems a much more logical step than playing the footballers that we already know are bad footballers. Just, it, yeah. to me, it make, makes sense to really just find out what we have in these lads now because... As we move forwards, yeah, the games still come thick and fast. But when you get towards the end of the season, we're going to end up in that situation again where it's one game a week, one game a week, and that'll be it, unless they can really push on in this cup competition. But with that performance, I don't see it because most of them lads don't want to play in the cup. They have absolutely no appetite to do it. And sooner or later, that's going to show. The only teams who can afford to go deep into this cup competition now are the very, very strong teams whose backup players, even when they have no appetite for a game, can still win games. That's why City win the League Cup every single year, because they can still do it despite pretty much not being bothered at all. Whereas if Everton aren't bothered, they will lose that game, and that's just how it's going to be. We'll get to that stage eventually, especially from what I saw. So instead of wasting time and going, right, in these crucial Premier League games, we'll lash out the lads who've let us down time and time again. 
let's lash out the young lads and see what they can do. And not loads of them. Let's not be stupid with it. Give Anthony Gordon minutes off the bench. Give Niels and Kunku a start, for God's sake, because that's the first time we've seen them since, what, September, October? Newcastle like, game. Was last time Newcastle. Well, exactly the Newcastle game when he was poor. But guess what? Everyone was poor. And we've mm. seen probably everyone else on that pitch apart from him since then. Just, yeah. And we will have had better games. And today, you couldn't have asked for much more when he came on. He came on, he was an influence on the game, and he really strengthened up that left hand side. I'd like to see more of him. No, yeah, I, I, you're not, I, not, no you're sort of yeah. Sorry, Matt. I was I was just gonna say where where that such a pertinent issue is, we've fallen down that trap so many times before. I, I even seen it today when when Tolson opens the score and well, let, let, let's pay credit to him. A really neat finish. Cracking ball through from Gordon and nice bread and butter goal for Everton to score. We don't score many of those type of goals. But then I, I still see an insincerity. I know a lot of people were sort of t- saying in jest, wow, you know, toast and put him in instead of Calvert Lewin and stuff like that. I've seen, I've seen a few, you know, frivolous sort of comments on that, but there were genuinely people talking about how, you know, oh, look, it looks like he's sharp again. Let's get him in the team. Um, he's, a, he's a viable alternative to Calvert Lewin uh, in terms of goal scoring. You know, he's a good finisher. Paying real compliment to him based on a goal against Rotherham in, in the FA Cup, where, you know, he would not have played a, a minute of at all, unless maybe the last few minutes, if we had the game sewn up, if it was any sort of importance to people. Um, just to reinforce Mike's point about Everton not caring uh, and players not caring. He, he's perhaps one that actually did. But it's it's blatantly obvious that he's not he's not good enough. Yet when he does something like that, I think a lot of our fans, and I've done it myself in the past, sort of think, you know, oh maybe this is the second coming. Maybe, maybe there is something there, and we'll do it time and time and time again, um, and and we'll never realise un- until these players come to leave, and then we can make a definitive conclusion that you know, hang on, yeah, he wasn't that good after all. But we're still always willing to give this chance rather than get some youth into the side who are going to be willing to fight for that shirt and, and want to make a career for themselves rather than others who are happy to be there and take the money. Yeah. Uh, just one final point, actually, before we wrap up today. Uh, yeah, I think the decoy deserves a lot of credit, not just for, for the goal, but coming on and, and settling everything down in midfield. And I think even, even though he probably didn't use the ball well at times today, Moses, when he, when he came on, I think just by being in that midfield and having a presence just mm-hmm. sort of helped us a lot you know it was sort of like as soon as he came on just by virtue of him being this this massive fella in the middle of the pitch that, that Rotherham stopped going through that area quite so often it's mad though you get to a certain point in the game where, where it is tired like that and you, you're crying out usually for your most creative player to come off the bench bring someone like Hammers or Anthony Gordon or Richarlison or whoever it may be just to make that difference in front of goal and today the midfield was that bad that we thought just just bring a central midfielder on. We just we just need a normal professional footballer in the middle. And I think that obviously the mobility is something that we've referenced already. And, and he is someone who, for the first time in years at Everton, is a, a central midfielder who's able to to not only be relatively comfortable on the ball, but also get about the pitch. Um, th- these are very basic attributes of professional footballers, but he it, for the first time in a long time, looks as though someone in blue who is capable of doing that. Um, I think it's quite important for him to to perform well in advanced areas. I think most of the play that we've seen from him this season has been primarily defensively, especially since Alan has been out. And I think the the vision that we were sold that was was started to realise not only today but but primarily, obviously, in in extra time, is that he is he is comfortable in front of goal. And that, that's the that's the box to box midfielder that we've needed. He he's done all of the good work, I would say, very much centrally in the pitch and, and in front of his own back four. We've asked him to do a lot of groundwork, sort of covering Seamus Coleman when Hamez is playing and all these sorts of very industrial roles that we've given him. But we do want to see him play his expansive game. We we've seen these these games at Watford where he is able to break the lines and carry the ball 30 yards and as much as that wasn't the, the chemistry of his goal today, I think it's important that he does start to play a role in that area of the pitch. Um, he's, he's clearly comfortable. He's clearly someone who is intelligent with his movements. I thought the the pass, obviously, coming from Hammers was was impressive. But 
I think it's it's probably a long time since we've seen a central midfielder think, well, I am going to advance myself 10 or 20 yards. I think it, it, it seems so basic to say it, but so often our central players are happy to let our attacking players do that side of the game for us and, and be relatively passive and, and spectate on Everton's forward play. And I think it, it's important that he sees himself as an integral part of that as opposed to just kind of a side piece going forward. I think it's an interesting point, that. And I would say that Abdullah Decore is one of Everton's most creative players, but he's creative in a different way. Not in the sense of, like, right, he's going to create 10, 12 assists a season with killer through balls, but mm. his ability to win the ball back, drag the team 20, 30 yards up the pitch and instigate attacks. Someone's got to do that. Someone's got to create that to then eventually create chances. Someone's got to be involved in that way. And his threat in front of goal as well added to that. It always adds a level of doubt within a defender's mind whether they can go and mark him tightly or you've got to leave space for him to actually be clever with the ball, which he can do as well. He can play very nice passes. But as you say, Mark, I think seeing a little bit more of that as Alan and Gabamin get fit, that will be a nice added piece to that. But all it, it, was, it was evidence that all it needed today was a Premier League quality midfielder. Because, yeah, as, as you said, Matt, he wasn't absolutely 10 out of 10 Abdullah Decore, the best that we've seen. It, it was just, he was, yeah, it was good. Came on, had a bit of energy about him. Um, was all right with the ball, not great, not terrible, but was composed and like a Premier League footballer. It's all that it needed today. And it was proof to me that Andre Gomez is probably not anymore. What's a Gabamon? <laughs> <laughs> oh god yeah will we see that lad ever again uh, but yeah <laughs> we'll leave it there uh, thanks very much to all the lads for, for coming on I uh, really appreciate your time uh, Everton are in the heart at least for Monday fourth and fifth round draw on Monday of course uh, here's open for a Chorley a home or a Marine a home if you can do something against Spurs tomorrow Dave wouldn't want that no um, yeah, I just want to enjoy, enjoy watching the game to be honest if there's anything like that if there's anything like that today I don't want lower league opposition Oh, dear. I don't want Liverpool either. Uh, yeah, oh God, yeah. Obviously, I had enough of that. Uh, but yeah, Tuesday against Wolves, obviously, we'll be doing all the build-ups to that on the Blue Room and the Blue Room Extra. Over the next few days, uh, enjoy what you can of your weekend, wherever you are in the world watching this. Stay safe and we'll speak.